Right over here. Let's have a look at some uh, breadboard capacitors. So here we can see some of the more typical types of capacitors you might find on a breadboard. We have um, electrolytic capacitors. Looks something like this. And, um, you can also have these where the leads um, come out from each end. And then you can have larger ones and smaller ones. And then you have um, ceramic. They look like that, or even smaller. Or they can actually look like this one also. There's another example of what they can look like. Um, the unit of a capacitor is farad, but um, that's hardly ever used because it's a uh, way too large <laughs> value if one says one farad. So, it's, so the, um, what we use to, um, for capacitors is usually when it's electrolytic, a little bit larger than it's uh, mi microfarads. And then um, you have um, uh, picofarads and then nanofarads, so the farad value gets um, smaller and smaller. Um, some capacitors actually have a polarity, so like in the, in this case, the um, electrolytic capacitor, you see that there's the minus side is marked, and um, in some cases they also mark the positive side, but it can be that only one polarity is marked. You can actually have polarity in other capacitor types, like four capacitors. They can also have polarity. So always check that when you're dealing with capacitors. Uh, when it comes to markings, electrolytic or larger capacitors, it's actually relatively um, easy to um, read the value directly. I can get the focus to work. It's directly printed on the, on the actual component. But the smaller it gets, the more difficult it gets to read. And when you get into really, really small capacitors, um, then they, they move to a slightly more cryptic way of um, marking the capacitors. But then I suggest that one does a quick, a quick internet search and one finds many different um, vi visual sort of representations of different capacitors. And then you can find the one that, that looks about similar as the one you're looking at. And then you can actually uh, reverse encode the um, the value of the capacitor. Um, then of course there are um, also surface mount capacitors, but those you usually don't use on a breadboard anyway. Uh, they, they're fun because they can actually, sometimes they don't have values marked on them at all. So anyway, let's do a little experiment. Uh, 1000 microfarad um, capacitor and uh, I've got a 9 volt battery. And the red button fills it with voltage. And the blue one will short it to ground. It means it empties the capacity capacitor and this one will empty the energy into the into the light emitting di diode. So let's see what happens when we charge it up. So it nearly reaches nine volts the um, the batteries not fully charged. But you'll notice an interesting thing that when we let it go then the um, voltage starts slowly dropping. And that's not just because of the load of the uh, voltmeter, it's because of the internal um, impedance leaks. So over time the capacitor will discharge by its own accord. So a capacitor is not a battery. And um, just to demonstrate that the capacitor is mainly used for energy storage, I can show you that if we press the, the um, white button, then you see that it gives a short burst of energy into the, um, into the um, lead. And you still have a little bit of voltage remaining because the, the forward voltage drop is still... Um, when it drops below the forward volt, the breakdown voltage to emit light, then... Um, the current stops flowing, so, but then we can uh, empty it by short circuiting. So that was a short demonstration of a um, capacitor. So now we're going to have a look at it in an RC circuit, which is one of the most common usages for a um, capacitor. 
So here we have the battery, and I've already measured that that's 8.8 .8 volts, not exactly 9. And then we have a 10 kilo ohm resistor, and we have a 1000 microfarad capacitor. And I have a voltage meter to measure the voltage over the capacitor. And then according to many books and theories, they say that it will take exactly 10 seconds for the capacitor to be charged to 63%. Uh, and um, the uh, formula is the resistance in ohms times the capacitance in farads, and then you get the time constant. So anyway, let's see if this is actually true, because uh, one can only prove things by experimentation. So I'm going to try and hit the, the on button on the battery at the same time I hit the clock. Here. And I'm going to try and hit the hold when it hits 10 seconds. Bingo. So that's 5.25 volts. Oh, can stop that. Now it should be, uh, the theoretical calculation was 5.5 volts. And I've tested this many times and depending on how accurate or inaccurate I am with my hands, then I always end up with 5.3. And the reason for the inaccuracy is that, of course, the, you know, the, the resistance isn't exactly 10 kilo ohms. It's, I could actually measure what it is, but it's, it's plus minus uh, 1%. And then the, um, the um, capacitance of the capacitor, it's not guaranteed to be 1000 microfarad. It could be something a little bit different. So, um, but I did, it was able to get a consistent result of 5.3, so a little, little bit under the theoretical 5.5. So, so anyway, that's a simple RC circuit. Okay, so I've just modified the RC circuit to have a 10 microfarad capacitor. And then what happens is the time constant um, changes to 0 0.1 seconds, and of course it's probably not possible to measure that with a voltage meter, so we're going to have to introduce a new measurement method. So, to be able to measure this one, I've set up the oscilloscope, so, so I've emptied the capacitor, and I've already set up the oscilloscope, and then we say we want to do a single trigger, and then I'm going to charge it. As you see, then we get the waveform. And it said something about hitting um, 63% after 0 0.1 milliseconds. So let's have a look what we can. So that's 100 milliseconds is one division. So that's a little bit before that point. No, it looks like 63, so it's a little bit more than halfway would be right there, and then that would be 63%. Well, then one sees that it also applies to whenever you change the combination of resistance capacitors, then you get a different time. And um, if you want to find out why it's exactly the why is the time constant on the 63%, that's to do with a lot of bunch of theory, but you can actually investigate that in, in, in many source books if you're interested where that where that actually comes from. But it's a useful thing to know. So resistance times capacitance gives you the time constants when it's, uh, it's going to be charged up from the source voltage to 63%. So now we're going to take a look at a low pass filter. So that's when you have the resistor and then you have a capacitor to ground in the series. I'm going to measure the input and output, but um, first a little, little bit of information. Um, if you want to um, calculate the 3 decibel um, point, which is usually the reference that everybody, well, everybody uses, uh, and then you can um, count, calculate the frequency by a formula 2 times pi times the resistance in ohms, times the capacitance in farads, and take an inverse of that, and then you get the 3 decibel 
uh, frequency. And um, you know, everybody likes talking about decibels, but I mean, it's basically it means that uh, when you put it through like a filter like this, then um, it's the point in which you have 70% um, of the amplitude um, getting through. <laughs> as, a, as a simple rule. <laughs> so anyway, let's have a look at um, what the signal looks like. So anyway, here's the um, signal, and this is channel 1, this is the input signal, and channel 2 is the output signal. And uh, as we see here, the output signal is getting dampened. Um, that's approximately 70% of the, um, well, exactly technically 71% if you want to round it that way, of the um, incoming um, signal. And then take into account also the fact that there are tolerances in both the resistor and the capacitor. So, uh, it's, uh, if you change these out, these components, even if you use the nominally the same values, you're going to get a slightly different result. So you have to be with these things you have to be a little bit budget oriented and um, as you see that you also get a phase shift and it's possible to actually calculate the phase shift but I left it out because usually you don't need that when you're um, if you're just going to filter signals okay let's see what happens if we um, increase the frequency by a factor of 100 that's for the fun of it. And then, oops, so then we see what happens to the output signal. It's a little bit fake, isn't it? But this is because if you see that the voltage division is now 100 millivolts, not 5 volts. So if we adjust that on the uh, second channel to be the same. Voltage division, increase it to 5, and now you see that basically this there's really nothing getting through. So well, that's why this is called a low pass filter. So let's try it in the other opposite direction. Let's um, take the 3 decibel frequency and then um, divide it by 100. Scale. Now you see, since we're running like 16 hertz, the Really, the, uh, the complete signal gets through, so that's the, the low, low pass filter passes in. Um, if we switch to square wave. And you see that it actually starts pretty much destroying the signal. Here you have the input signal, and here you have the output signal, because what's happening is it's actually filtering out the artificial frequencies that are used to build the um, square waves. So the function generator, when it's going to make a square wave, mixes up different frequencies, and then um, the, the um, filter is now filtering away um, certain frequencies. So if we have a look at Here's the input frequency distribution. And you see what frequencies are coming into the input of the um, filter and what what's are um, getting out. So you have like um, decibels on this scale, frequency on that scale. And then we take the output signal. And here you see that it's um, Keeping the frequencies that are on the lower on the lower side of the frequency scale, and then it's dampening it, dampening it. all the higher frequency 
frequencies used to build the square wave or wave are getting that. So that's why you see that um, this this weird phenomenon where it actually destroys the you know, nice um, square wave on that. So now we're gonna talk about a high pass filter. So basically what you do is you change the position of the components so you put the capacitor first and then the resistance to ground and um, basically the only thing that changes is you get a phase shift that is different from what you had with the low pass filter but the um, formula you use to calculate the three decibel um, frequency is the, exactly the same so there's no difference there So let's see what happens if we um, we reduce the frequency. Well, let's put in our reference 16 hertz. So as you see now it's the same scenario except the reversed order where the output is minimized. So let's try and adjust that to be, to be the same. Well, it's 5 volt for division and as you see it's really nothing getting through. So anyway, let's try the other opposite again. So higher frequency. Now it's passing, um, passing through the um, signal pretty much without alteration. And then just for the fun of it, we can uh, actually have a look what it does to our nice um, square wave. Seems to be behaving much better. frequency instead because this is still the um, 160 kilohertz so then it um, won't have much of an impact but let's put the um, back the 3 decibel frequency so now we get a little bit more of a, <laughs> of a clear effect on, on the um, on the filtering because now it's again destroying frequencies. So it's taking away the low low frequencies instead of the high. So then it completely at certain frequencies it'll completely destroy the you know, the you know, square wave. So let's have a look at one of the last oh the last use case, which is a using capacitor as a blocking a DC blocking component. So um, as you see now the input and output are sync because there's no DC offset on the input but let's say that you have an unwanted DC um, DC voltage on the input let's try to like 2 volts on the input side of DC and you, the only thing you want to pass through is the signal so you want to um, process the AC signal so as you see now the output is is um, it's the DC component of the input signal has disappeared and um, you, know, you only have the, the varying signal available so then you can further process it and that, that occurs in quite many circuits where you don't want, you don't want the DC offset wandering through your circuits because of, you know, if it's amplifiers and stuff then weird things will start happening so I hope you found that informative um, please consider subscribing uh, hit the like button. Uh, yeah, merch is available. If you feel like, you also buy me a cup of coffee. Uh, I spend the evenings making these videos. Uh, links are in the comments. Uh, and um, I'll see you in the next one.